a great time. Uh, we have uh, Sammy Tenago with us uh, this morning. Great time with them. Friday night with the, the kids. Uh, we did some filming here uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday afternoon for uh, uh, satellite program. Uh, Sammy will be telling you about the Lord's open the door uh, for him. So he uh, asked me if I would uh, uh, like to sit down and be filmed and, uh, and share, share my testimony with 40 or 50 Muslims. I said, well, let me pray about it. Yeah, I don't think I'll get another opportunity like that. So uh, anyway, so we did that, did a couple little Bible studies, and, and uh, we're, we're praying that the, the Lord will, uh, via Sammy and his program, and get it on the air, and the Lord will, uh, will, uh, will use it. You, you just never know. You know, it's just, isn't that an amazing thing? You just never, never know how God might use some uh, very simple things to, to reach many people with, uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we know Sammy and his wife for a number of years, and uh, you're going you're gonna to enjoy the message he has for you. Why don't you welcome Sammy Tanago. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a joy to be here with you today. I always enjoy it when I come and uh, uh, see humble believers that love Jesus. Uh, we're going to watch a DVD. Bonnie is going to help us uh, to watch it, but... Tim saying, share his testimony with 50 Muslims, you said? Actually, tens of millions of Muslims. Tens of millions. God is giving us opportunity to use uh, the biggest Arabic Christian satellite TV station, perhaps in the world. It's called Al Karma. Uh, if you want me to give you the website. Uh, and uh, they use seven satellite dishes that broadcast uh, all over the world. Actually, they reach all Australia and Europe. And, you, and the Middle East, and America, and Mexico. Anyway, but I want you to watch the DVD, and then uh, I will share uh, with you a message that God puts on my heart. In order for a culture to maintain itself for more than 25 years, there must be a fertility rate of 2.11 children per family. With anything less, the culture will decline. Historically, no culture has ever reversed a 1.9 fertility rate. A rate of 1.3, impossible to reverse. Because it would take 80 to 100 years to correct itself. And there is no economic model that can sustain a culture during that time. In other words, if two sets of parents each have one child, there are half as many children as parents. If those children have one child, then there are one-fourth as many grandchildren as grandparents. If only a million babies are born in 2006, it's hard to have two million adults enter the workforce in 2026. As the population shrinks, so does the culture. As of 2007, the fertility rate in France was 1.8, England 1.6, Greece 1.3, Germany, 1.3. Italy, 1.2. Spain, 1.1. Across the entire European Union of 31 countries, the fertility is a mere 1.38. Historical research tells us these numbers are impossible to reverse. In a matter of years, Europe as we know it will cease to exist. Yet the population of Europe is not declining. Why? Immigration. Islamic immigration. Of all population growth in Europe since 1990, 90% has been Islamic immigration. France, 1.8 children per family. Muslims, 8.1. In southern France, traditionally one of the most populated church regions in the world, there are now more mosques than churches. 30% of children ages 20 and younger are Islamic. In the larger cities such as Nice, Marseille and Paris, that number has grown to 45%. By 2027, one in five Frenchmen will be Muslim. In just 39 years, France will be an Islamic Republic. In the last 30 years, the Muslim population of Great Britain rose from 82,000 to 2.5 million, a 30-fold increase. There are over 1,000 mosques, many of them former churches. In the Netherlands, 
50% of all newborns are Muslim, and in only 15 years, half of the population of the Netherlands will be Muslim. In Russia, there are over 23 million Muslims. That's one out of five Russians. 40% of the entire Russian army will be Islamic in just a few short years. Currently in Belgium, 25% of the population and 50% of all newborns are Muslim. The government of Belgium has stated one third of all European children will be born to Muslim families by 2025, just 17 years away. The German government, the first to talk about this publicly, recently released a statement saying, the fall in the German population can no longer be stopped. Its downward spiral is no longer reversible. It will be a Muslim state by the year 2050. Muammar al-Gaddafi of Libya said, there are signs that Allah will grant victory to Islam in Europe without swords, without guns, without conquest. We don't need terrorists. We don't need homicide bombers. The 50 plus million Muslims in Europe will turn it into a Muslim continent within a few decades. There are currently 52 million Muslims in Europe. The German government said that number is expected to double in the next 20 years to 104 million. Closer to home, the numbers tell a similar story. Right now, Canada's fertility rate is 1.6, nearly a full point below what is required to sustain a culture. And Islam is now the fastest growing religion. Between 2001 and 2006, Canada's population increased by 1.6 million, 1.2 of those immigration. In the United States, the current fertility rate of American citizens is 1.6. With the influx of the Latino nations, the rate increases to 2.11, the bare minimum required to sustain a culture. In 1970, there were 100,000 Muslims in America. Today, there are over 9 million. The world is changing. It's time to wake up. Three years ago, a meeting of 24 Islamic organizations was held in Chicago. The transcripts of that meeting showed in detail their plans to evangelize America through journalism, politics, education, and more. They said, we must prepare ourselves for the reality that in 30 years, there will be 50 million Muslims living in America. The world that we live in is not the world in which our children and grandchildren will live. The Catholic Church recently reported that Islam has just surpassed their membership numbers. Some studies show that at Islam's current rate of growth, in five to seven years, it will be the dominant religion of the world. As believers, we call upon you to join the effort to share the gospel message with the changing world. This is a call to action. Sentence again. I love how that DVD ended. This is a call to action. And I love it how God does uses us, bring us together uh, so we can take action uh, for him big that neither one of us can take alone. I love it how he does that. Bring different parts of the body of Christ together. And then we have a church, we have a ministry, and we do big things. Now, the first point of the DVD is Muslims are growing very rapidly all over the world. We tell American pastors, hello, what have you been doing to the Muslims lately? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> uh, the Christian leaders in America uh, spend the billions of dollars every day and all their time do so many things, and they don't spend the 2% of their budget or time to witness effectively to Muslims who are growing very rapidly all over the world. Uh, in America, we have about 20 million Muslims. How do I know that? From experience. This is my ministry. I live in Orange County, California, 
we have about 500,000 Muslims, Los Angeles, about 1 million Muslims. Anytime I want to give my book, I wrote a book to share Jesus effectively with Muslims, answer their questions. So anytime I want to give my book to a Muslim, what do you think I do? I go out. Anytime my wife tell me, take me out, take me out, I want to go to that store, I can't drive alone, God tell me, don't worry, I'm not going to waste your time, go out with her. 99% <laughs> I meet Muslim, and I give him the book. I go to Calvary Chapel, Fremont, actually it's a small church, about 40 people, uh, and the pastor Tim Brown has been supporting our ministry a long time ago, and I told him, this is a big sacrifice to you, this is your very small church, and he said, we believe this is important because we have in Fremont, California, 40,000 Afghani Muslims. Can you imagine that one county? I go to Dearborn, Michigan, uh, and I rent a table. Usually, last time I had two tables. We put thousands of Christian materials, and a crowd of 50,000 Muslims passed by our tables in four days period, three, four days period. And the more of them took the materials than five, six years ago. So Muslims now are more open to the gospel. We know that. And the believers in Dearborn told me, oh, we are so glad that you come, give your book. We have one million Muslims in Dearborn, Michigan, and the surrounding area. Now, most of these Muslims in America and Europe and all over the world, most of them don't understand what we talk about in the Bible. Uh, Muslims usually ask, you Christians believe Jesus is the son of God? The Quran told us, how can God have a son if he doesn't have a wife? Hello? And you say God loves his son? You expect us to believe? What kind of a logic is that? If you are a father, you saw a bunch of criminals killing your child, wouldn't you go to rescue your son? Don't you love your son? That's what a good loving heavenly father would have done if Jesus is his son. In other ways, since they were children, Muslims are taught certain way. They received certain reasons to believe Christianity doesn't make any sense. Islam makes more sense, even though it is not helping us, but it looks like this is the most, the best we can get. They never been exposed to the beauty, the power, the depth, of the Christian faith. The reasons, the evidence, the logic behind the biblical teaching never been communicated to them in a way they can understand. Because most of us know that communication happens not because of the words of the speaker alone, but also because of the understanding of the listener. I know that very well. When I changed my culture from Egyptian Middle Eastern culture, when I arrived to Orange County, California, 1980, I had a culture shock for five years. Why my neighbor does not smile at me? Why my neighbor doesn't want to talk to me? Why people in the church don't hug me? Why, why, why? Culture shock. I used to be very lonely, and I would go to my church a few times a week. I have like 10,000 people at church, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and I see a beautiful American girl worshiping Jesus. I see her again, and I said, wow. So I go to her, I tell her, my name is Sammy. I'm very happy to meet you. <laughs> she usually looks at me with suspicious and say, what's up? Nothing up. Please give me your parents' phone number. Why? Because my parents are coming. I like my parents to call your parents. <laughs> what for? To be very honest with you, you are so beautiful. I've been watching you. And you love Jesus. Maybe we can talk with our families. Maybe we can pray together. I don't know, but maybe... It's God's will. We get married. <laughs> Mary, I think we have a good chance. <laughs> married, this is so weird. No, I'm not weird. I'm normal. <laughs> normal man. <laughs> and the more I try to get the family involved, the more I get rejected. For a couple of years, I wondered why. I had pure motives. Uh, great sense of humor. I look good. <laughs> hey, 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 1982, I looked beautiful, okay? <laughs> I have pictures. <laughs> to me, this is the most honorable way to approach a girl. To her, that's how my sisters got married. That's what I believe in. Family has to be involved from the beginning. To her, this is the most 
a stupid, uncool way that any man can approach her. And God taught me the lesson long time ago. And told me, now listen, if you want to be used to your greatest potential to bring as many Muslims to Christ that I, I want you to do, you need to start praying. Don't just give them Bibles and uh, tell them Jesus loves you. You need to start praying that I will guide you, help you, use your mind to answer their questions the best way possible. To penetrate their heart, to engage their feelings because they are emotional people. They understand through stories and parables. And God taught me so many ways. I, you know, I had to write a book in the, in the end after 10 years of learning from God and from other people. And I'll give you an example. We know from studying the Quran that Muslims and the Muhammad are commanded to follow the faith of Abraham. They are commanded to take Abraham's life as an example to follow. So we ask Muslims, well, how about the Prophet Abraham? He did not merely watch his son being murdered, but actually one day he was taking his son in one hand and a knife to butcher him with the other. Was he a good prophet? Was he a good father? Like the Quran said, and God said, do not kill. Muslims say, of course he was. How can you explain? He was about to kill his son, had not God stopped him. And God said, do not kill. And Muslims are thinking, and Muslims will agree with you that if Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son to God, then he proved beyond any doubt that he has perfect sacrificial love to God. And we tell Muslims, great, that's exactly what God wants us to discover from the story of Abraham. Because the Bible told us in Romans 5, 8, God manifested, demonstrated his own love toward us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And why God asked Abraham to give him his son? Commandment even doesn't look good. Why not give your land or fast or pray? It was a test. Because if Abraham was willing to give his son to God, then he proved beyond any doubt, and the Muslim will agree with you, that he is willing and ready to give God everything and anything he has. And we tell Muslims, that's exactly, you are very close to what God wants us to discover, because the Bible told us about God in Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but give him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And do we tell Muslims, the moment we put our faith in Jesus, and we became children of God, and we experienced the forgiveness of our sins, and the guilt was removed, when we knew the story is true, Jesus came, died for our sins. At that moment and now, we know in the depths of our heart that God will give us the most awesome life we can ever have on earth. Of course, as we walk with him, ah, that's a condition. We walk according to his will. Then we're going to get the best life. And one day, God's going to give us everything. He's going to share his kingdom and glory with us. How do we know that for sure? Because he gave us Jesus. You know, our ministry praying, me and my wife, almost every week, that a rich American man will donate a building to us. So we can have offices and volunteer will come and all that. Now let's say somebody donated a building. And then I need a chair or a table. Don't you think I can go to that man and tell him, uh, please buy us a chair, I need a chair, and he will give it to me? Right? Why? Because he gave us a building. Now, the Bible told us about God. He who did not spare his own son, but give him up for us all. How? <laughs> Will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? <laughs> but Satan always like us to doubt it. God's awesome plan for our lives. And to, to go to take things from him, not wait for God, but to take what Satan can give us. No, wait for God. God's going to give you the best life. Emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, all aspects. Now, we are not ignoring their objection, but actually we are using their objection. We're starting where they are at. We are connecting with them. We are using their beliefs 
in God's commandment to Abraham, recorded in the Quran, we are using a powerful emotional story to penetrate their heart, engage their feelings, to make a far more powerful presentation of Jesus than any normal presentation would have achieved. Now, this is important. I will tell you why. Because uh, Jesus gave a clear parable in the Gospel of Matthew 13, verse 19, when he said, uh, some seed, you know, the word of God fell on the lives of people that did not understand. And it was easy for the wicked one to snatch away the word of God that was sown in their lives. Matthew 13, verse 19. So, God is expecting us to use our mind, love him with all our mind, to present the most important message in the world, his love and salvation, Jesus, the biblical teaching, in the most understandable way to the people we are talking with. And for our uh, focus today, to Muslims, because they are the least evangelized people in the world. Muslims. Because the church in America, for example, has not been investing time or resources or technology or money to reach out to them. Okay, now why this is important? Because when we share Jesus effectively with Muslims, so many Muslims come to Christ. <laughs> do you do ask me, how do you know that? I know that from the emails I'm getting. God, God is confirming that to me. I, I, am, I, am, I am extremely excited, more than excited. I mean, uh, you, can, you, did not, you got one of the ministry report, but you did not get this one. You can get some of this one. I was teaching, uh, uh, and uh, you can give maybe a few people that will put it in the table if somebody want to take it. I was teaching uh, in Israel, Calvary Chapel Bible College and another seminary, and then I got uh, a surprise invitation to speak in Bethlehem Seminary, the biggest seminary in, in Israel, and the president invited me to lunch, so I thanked him very much. And they said, no, I am the one who thank you. I told them, yeah, I've been wondering why you invited me to lunch and to speak in your seminary. And I have a very small ministry in America. And he said, you might have a small ministry, but you gave us 2,000 copies of your book in Arabic. Actually, we did not give him anything. We printed 5,000 copies in Israel. We did not know who took them. And we do that in many parts of the world. And Africa, Russia, Romania, any place we can. And he said, well, let me tell you something. We took 2,000 copies. We gave them to Palestinian Muslims in the West Bank, and we won 100 Muslims to Christ. And now we don't know what to do with them because the Christians don't love them. They don't trust them. They don't want to invite them to their homes. They don't want to hire them. They don't want to marry them, and we have a problem now. So we want you with your wife, because my wife is ex-Muslim, to speak in the seminary and to help us overcome this obstacle because they need us because they start losing contact with their Muslim friends. So when we share Jesus effectively with Muslims, we answer their questions. Many of them come to Christ. Why this is important? Because most of the churches in America, for example, know nothing and do nothing to share Jesus effectively with Muslims. How they miss it. <laughs> Every four persons living in the world, one of them is a Muslim. And almost all the pastors in America are not even praying. God equip our church to witness effectively. Was, no, they are not. And even when they go to Israel, they only walk where Jesus walk. And they come back, oh, we were blessed. Have you gone to the Muslims, Palestinians, and tell them? God is love. We, God, when we put our faith in Jesus, we became born of God's Spirit. God's Spirit came to live within us. And we love the Jews. We love the Israelis. We love the Arabs. We love Palestinians. We love Muslims. We love everybody. God loves you and God lives in us. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. You know, have you done that? No. It's not part of the tour. What? <laughs> You're spending $3,000 and two weeks of your life to walk where Jesus walk. You could have gotten a DVD for 25 bucks and do that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and you come back, you say the Bible became alive. Hello? The Bible becomes alive not when you walk where Jesus walked, when you walk 
as Jesus walked. That's what the Bible said. He who abides in love, who, he who practices love, abides in God and God in him. You walk as Jesus walked, you deny yourself, the Bible will become alive to you because the Holy Spirit will illuminate your mind and spirit and you will enjoy actually God's presence. Okay, so this is the first point. There is a growing need and in America, for example, very few pastors are like Pastor Tim that's saying, we are open, we want God to prepare us, maybe God can use our church to meet this need. Very few pastors are saying that. How do I know that? I talk to pastors all the time. They will invite a band and they will give a band $10,000 or a football player and they make big flyer, but witnessing to Muslims? Uh -uh. Well, this is an action you can take. You can pray for the pastors in America that God will wake them up. You know, pastors in America, uh, after 9-11, I was getting phone calls from hundreds of pastors, but that's for two years only. <laughs> after that, everything died. They lost interest. Now, what is God's mind? God's mind is clear from the beginning. God chose Abraham, and God told Abraham, I will bless you, and through you, underline the word all. So it was God's original plan from choosing Abraham and choosing Israel, not only to, to bless them because he loves them so much more than everybody else, ah, uh -uh, to bless them and use them as a blessing. Uh, God has to choose somebody. <laughs> God has to trust somebody and bless that person so he can reveal God's love and be a blessing to others. And God is telling us, you and me, the same thing. I chose you. I called you by name. Each one of us being called by God by name. And I blessed you. Let me remind you, in case if Satan made you forget, God put us in the greatest country in the world, America. The best. God guided us to a genuine Christian movement for us, Calvary Chapel, uh, but we have guests. They go to other good churches. I mean, there are so many wonderful evangelical churches in America. In Hawaii, they are all over Hawaii. So God gave us a spiritual uh, knowledge and experience of his presence. God forgave all of our sins because of Jesus. Life is difficult, it's challenging, we suffer, we grow old. God said, no problem, I will live within you. I will unite myself to you so you don't have to face a difficult moment alone. Life is short, God gave us eternal life. You know how short life is? It can end like that, boom, over. Just like that. I know many of my friends died in their 50s. Boom. And if it didn't end like that, you see how quickly every year passes? Just give it 15 more years. <laughs> half of us here will be most likely dead. The other half, most of them will be getting old, getting sick, and they will die soon also. This is the good news I came to share with you today. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> Don't expect to live like Charles does. <laughs> Don't count on that. He's an exception. You do know that Charlie donated to the ministry generously? And maybe that's one of the reasons that God is prolonging his life and giving him success. He's a generous man for the work of God. Now, God is telling all of us, I chose you and I blessed you because I love you. This is very personal. You know how much God loves us? We were thinking, God always forgives our sins. Wow! Every time I make a mistake, I go to God. God, you know my heart, I, I want to be 100% with you. But I made a mistake. God said, before you mention it, forgiven. And I will bless you again. And I want to use your life. God is always opening his hand and his arms uh, 
uh, and his heart and willing to bless us every day in spite of who we are. Wow! God is telling us, I love you and I bless you and I will bless you forever because I love you. But don't ever forget, God has an awesome plan for each one of us to use as a blessing to as many families as we let him. You want to know one of the secret of the exciting, interesting life you can have? The more you cooperate with God and tell him, okay, let's make a deal. I, am, I agree. Bless me this week. Bless me this month. Bless me this year and use me as a blessing. You know what God's going to do? God's going to bless you. Why? Because God knows that our ability to be a blessing is very limited. And if he saw in our heart and in our mind a desire not to be selfish but to be a blessing, he's going to say, that's a person qualified to receive my blessing because he is going to be faithful in passing my blessing and communicating my blessing to other families. You want to be blessed? Cooperate with God's plan. That's it. Genesis 6, 17, God promised Abraham to bless Ishmael. Ishmael is the physical and the spiritual ancestor to the Muslim people. They came from Ishmael. When God gave circumcision at the sign of the covenant to Abraham, Abraham and Ishmael were circumcised together. The Bible records God was with Ishmael as he grew up. Aha! <laughs> Don't ignore Ishmael. <laughs> Genesis 16, God promised Hagar to multiply her descendants exceedingly. Wow! Verse 11, God himself named the Hagar unborn son Ishmael, which means God hears. The same verse, God heard Hagar's affliction. Genesis 21, God heard Ishmael crying. Now, when we go through difficult time, who hears our cry? Who? God. More than anyone else. <laughs> and he can actually do something about it. But don't forget, God also wants us to hear the cry of the people that don't know him. And because Muslims has been ignored, so today, God wants us to hear the cry of Muslims. Let me give you two evidence that they are crying. One, you've seen what's happened in the Muslim world in the past 20, 25 years. Tens of millions of Muslims attacking each other, killing each other. Now, as I'm speaking, they are killing each other in many Muslim countries, and they're attacking each other verbally. And they have been discovering that they are not God's family. <laughs> they thought that they are one family, one ummah, one nation, Muslim nation. No, they discovered that they are not God's family. Now, remember what Jesus said, by this all will know that you are my disciples. If, talk to me, love one another. What does that mean? If you love one another, if we love one another, and a non-Christian person came here, that non-Christian is going to say, this looks like God's family. I would love to be part of that family. Right? Now, Muslims are doing the opposite. Muslims are killing each other all over the Muslim world. Almost. So they've been discovering, we are looking for a loving family. We are not God's family. And they discover that their leaders are criminals violating human rights and violating the law. They discover that their spiritual leaders are spiritually bankrupt. They are false teachers because they failed to provide them the solution for their problems, unity, peace, love. And the Muslim people right now are experiencing their greatest crises ever. They are open to the gospel more than any other time in history. Number two evidence, remember, most of the Muslim people are like Cornelius. You remember Cornelius? Cornelius in Acts 10, 
He was neither a Jew nor born again Christian. But the Bible recorded that he was a man that believed in God and the alms of Cornelius were accepted. Wow! God was looking at Cornelius' efforts to please the Creator and to have a good conscience. And God was saying, I accept what you are doing for me. Maybe more than most of the Jewish leaders are doing, even though they are the people of the covenant. Covenant was God. But God accepted Cornelius' actions. Why? Because it was done with a pure heart. I love God, the creator. God is good. He gave me a conscience. I want to do something to please the creator, to help his creation, help the poor. And God said, I looked at that heart. I accept what you are doing for me. Peter, go tell Cornelius about Jesus. But before God can use Peter, God needed to help Peter overcome his prejudice against a God-fearing man from a different background and different color skin and different nationality, a foreigner. And that's what God's trying to do with the church leaders in America. <laughs> trying to make them, when you go to Israel or, or any place, go to Muslims and love them like you love the Jews and the Israelis and the, the blue eyes and beautiful blonde hair. <laughs> and then tell them about Jesus. You remember when Hagar and Ishmael ran out of water, they were dying. What happened? Did God let them die? Uh-uh. God intervened, told Hagar, do not be afraid. I hear the Ishmael crying. Lift up Ishmael by the hand. I will make into him a great nation. Wow! And God personally opened Hagar's eyes, a miracle, and he saved their life. You know, when I read this story so many years ago, God told me, this is part of your message because it proves that Ishmael's birth was not just merely, simply a mistake Abraham did. Ah, it proves my love to Ishmael and my wonderful plans from his birth and the birth of his children. First Chronicle. Remember these two names, the two firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar and Nebaioth. Why important? Because Isaiah 21 told us that the Arab people came from Kedar. Ishmael's first two sons, Kedar and Nebaioth, Arab people came from Kedar. And then we have a significant prophecy. Isaiah 60, all Kedar's flocks will be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth will serve you they will be accepted as offering on my altar. Tan -ta -ta -ta. Tan -tan. Tan -tan -tan. This is exciting. I was jumping in my home when I looked at the Christian commentaries and I discovered the time God gave these words to Prophet Isaiah and told him to say these words. I discovered that Kedar and Nebaioth had been dead already for a thousand years. Are you with me? So God was not talking about Kedar and Nebaioth because they've been dead a thousand years ago. He was referring to their children, Arabs and Muslims. Did you get this? You got it? Prophet Isaiah was not talking about Kedar and Nebaioth. Why? Because they had been dead a thousand years ago. Aha! Arabs and Muslims will be gathered together with their families. They will be saved in the day of the harvest. I'll give you a personal testimony. About seven years ago, something like that, me and my wife were overwhelmed by the magnitude of the ministry. How can we reach these Muslims even in Orange County? We know it's our calling, but we did not know what to do exactly. There are too many of them everywhere. So God told us, listen, this is not your ministry. This is a church ministry. You are only a part of the ministry. So tell God, what does that mean? God said, don't try to do the ministry by yourself. You need to start a nonprofit ministry, glad news for Muslims. Take this ministry to the church. I will open the door in the churches that I want to use. 
I will connect you with the pastors and believers that I want to use, and I want you to do two things. One, motivate, equip my church to witness effectively to Muslims. I will give you the message and the materials and everything. Two, invite the pastors and believers whom I blessed to pray for you and to help you. So instead of you reaching a few Muslims every month, you can reach hundreds, then thousands, then millions. And thank God we are reaching this point now through the satellite TV. We start already. So it was really a great idea from God that we don't try to do the ministry by ourselves because we are reaching five, ten people every month. Now, me and my wife, we looked at each other and said, non-profit ministry? We're going to have a letterhead? Which Bible verse are we going to put in our letterhead? The first question, immediately, at the same time, God gave us John 10, 16. <laughs> Jesus said, I have other sheep are not of this sheep fold. I must also bring them. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So God told us from the beginning, multitudes of the sheep are the flocks and the rams of Kedar and Nebaiah. Arabs and Muslims will be gathered with their families. They will be saved in the day of the harvest. It's amazing that most of the churches ignore these huge harvests that are coming. Isn't that amazingly that God uses the small churches, the humble, the, the weak, doesn't use the churches that have thousands of people and all that? It's amazing how God works. You know, uses the weak. David, the youngest, the shepherd, uses Gideon with a few hundred fighters. I mean, I love it. That gives me hope. God's going to use me. I have a small ministry. God's going to use me. Jeremiah 49. Iranian Muslims will come to Christ. So I had $10,000 in the bank. So God told me, spend the money you have in the bank. Send your book to be translated from the best Farsi translator in Colorado Springs and print it and start giving it to Iranian Muslims. So I did, was praying, God, use this $10,000. <laughs> you know, praying hard. One of the emails I got, my father is Iranian and was raised in the Muslim religion. When I became a Christian 19 years ago, I bought him a Bible in Farsi. He does not understand. Over the years, he has had many questions which my husband and I done our best to answer. However, uh, when I got hold of your book, Glad News, God Loves You, My Muslim Friend in Farsi, I was so excited to share it with him. About a month later, as he and I spoke, he couldn't stop telling me how much he loved the book. Tra -tra. He finally understood. Tra -tra -tra. I am so thankful uh, for your book. It has answered so many of his questions and giving him clarity. I am blessed to say he considers himself a Christian now. See, we take action, and God uh, bring Muslims to Christ. Isaiah 19, 21, uh, God promised to save Muslims in Egypt. And do you know what God has done in Egypt? God allowed the Muslim Brotherhood to control the government, and all the fanatic Muslims joined them for one year, and they persecuted Christians, and they persecuted moderate Muslims. And the Christians were able to repent and to put their faith in God, and they forgave them. And the Christians prayed, and God answered the prayer, and got rid of the Muslim Brotherhood. Now we have a moderate government, a democratic government. And the average Muslim person in Egypt was able to compare the actions and words of the Muslim Brotherhood and the fanatic Muslims with the actions and words of the church and the Christians that has been purified and repenting and filled with God's Spirit. So they saw in the Muslim hate. And they look at the Christian, they saw love. At the Muslim, they saw pride, harshness, Christians, humility, gentleness. You get the idea. That leaves the average Muslim in Egypt open to the gospel. <laughs> See what God is doing? God is amazingly preparing the Muslim world to receive Christ. 
Isaiah 19, 25. <laughs> God's going to get the job done. God's going to do it. Uh, God said, blessed be Egypt, my people. Your people, that's what God said, my people. Assyria, the work of my hand. Israel, my inheritance. People in heaven will come from all over the world. Muslims are growing all over the world. We got prophecies. Conclusion. Multitudes of Muslims will be in heaven. It's a done deal. The only question that remains to be answered, who God will use to tell them about Jesus. Now, if, if God, God can get the job done, visions and dreams and the Holy Spirit, angels, you know. But I say, it looks like we have a good chance to be used by God. God's plan A is to use us. Okay, why? Because two reasons, God told me, because when I use you, that makes your life extremely interesting and worth living. And in spite of the problems and the suffering and the uh, challenges and difficulties you get every day almost. I tell God, yeah, you're right. The more you use my life, the more I can face the problems and, uh, and be strong because I know that I'm going to be rewarded forever. And God told me, and that's the second reason. The more I use you, the more you're going to be rewarded in heaven. So I want you to be a, a winner now and forever. And you are my child. Uh, by grace, I want to use you. You remember the Passion of Christ movie? Before the movie was released, a big rumor got out there. The movie is anti-Semitic because it shows that the Jews crucified Jesus. Now, you and I know Jesus was crucified to pay the penalty for our sins. However, God used this rumor that the movie is against the Jews, against the Israelis, to do what? To get so many Muslim leaders excited about the movie. <laughs> I was jumping again. <laughs> so as soon as the movie was released, most of the Muslim leaders that heard about it bought the movie, put it in their theater, and told their people, go watch what the bad Jews have done to the good prophet Jesus. You're talking about millions of Muslims everywhere went to watch to justify the way they feel toward the Israelis, toward the Jews. And I got reports, some of the reports I got, they were crying like babies. Remember, Muslims are emotional. They are different than Americans or Europeans. In America, I used to work for the government uh, my boss sent me to take a class, how you control your feelings. <laughs> I told her, you are kidding. She said, no, I'm not kidding. You're going to take that class. I told her, okay, you are my boss. I'll take it, but just tell me why. Because I think I have a very healthy feeling. I never had any tragedy in my life. You know, my parents were normal, um, sister, brothers, and, you know. I had many problems in my life, but never a tragedy. And she said, I know you have a healthy feeling, but... I told her, why you want me to take the class? I want to take computer class to be smart like Americans. She said, no, I want to take that class. And since you asked me why, I will tell you why. Because you express your feelings so much. I told her, so? I thought this is good. So you know how I feel. We understand each other. She said, no, actually, no. You came here to do a job. Sammy, just do your job. We are not interested to know how you feel. Just do your job and leave. I cried for three days. <laughs> You think I'm a machine? <laughs> I come to do a job and leave? Don't talk? Everybody's talking. I don't know what it is. She had problems with Egyptian or what. <laughs> but in America, people are very good in controlling their feelings. You know, in America, you can drink coffee with your boss and have a nice conversation, and he will smile. And next day, you are fired. <laughs> How do I know that happens to me to ice? Anyway, Muslims are extremely emotional. So God used the most extreme emotional method and penetrated multitudes of Muslims' hearts and made them feel his love and salvation. And they started getting more dreams, more visions. God is preparing the Muslim world. They're killing each other. The young people are asking questions. Where is the truth? Our leaders are horrible, looking for better 
people that believes in better principle examining the Christian faith, they are more open to the gospel than ever. What is the good news that makes me exciting? God already starts fulfilling the prophecies. Before I ran out of time, I have to prove it to you because this is very important. Just reading to you a couple of the emails that I get. Uh, I spoke at a big church in Florida that's called Calvary Chapel, Tallahassee, maybe three, four times. Before I went the last time, I got an email. My name is Malak. I am originally from Lebanon. I came to the state 207 to finish my studies. I live in Tallahassee, Florida. I'm a Muslim. I have always been a Muslim. She's a Muslim girl, believes that she worships God, and she is fine. Seven months ago, somebody gave me a copy of your book. Uh, let me say, since I read this book, I fell in love with God. I am now happier than before. I saw and felt what I haven't seen nor felt before. God's love for me. The only problem is now I feel I am in the middle. I am falling in love with Jesus. I told her, Malak, this is not a serious problem. Keep reading. Keep praying. Let's communicate more. She did that. I am done reading the book. It is one of the most beautiful books that I have ever read. It opened my heart to God in a very beautiful way. I am planning to get a copy in Arabic when I visit my parents in Lebanon. Your book has it changed the way I look to God. Certainly changed my life. Last email. Thanks for helping me experience and enjoy God's love and salvation. Of course, you know that it is not my words that it changed her life. The Holy Spirit used the word of God to convict her of her sin and of Jesus' righteousness and of the day of judgment. However, I discovered through the years that God loves to use us. That's why it's important for each one of us to walk with God because when you walk with God, year after year, God is going to use you bigger and in a bigger and in a bigger way as you walk with Very important. So God used me to remove the rocks from the field, to cultivate the ground, to use parables and the stories to uh, illustrate the logic, the reasons behind uh, the Christian faith, the biblical teaching. So God used me, uh, it was a calling to write a book to present the word of God in the most understandable way and give the seed the best chance of being received in the ground and accepted and understood. And God used American Christians like you from the Calvary Chapel churches I talked to uh, to pray for me and for the ministry. And some Christians financially supported the ministry, $10 a month, $20 a month. And we have the book now in 11 languages, and we try to print it all over the world, as many countries as possible. And every couple of years, we translate it to a different language. And God is bringing Muslims to Christ. God is using the body of Christ. I love it. Uh, this is an email from Pastor David Witt. David Witt was one of the prominent directors with Voice of the Martyrs, big organization. Now he quit. He has his own ministry, a Spirit of Martyrdom. You can Google him. So I gave him my materials, and he sent me two emails, very important. One of them, see what God is doing. I am glad to share with you wonderful news of your book, Glad News, God Loves You, My Muslim Friend, Impacting Lives in North Africa. We try to print it there, of course. I am involved with Muslim background believers in Jesus Christ in Northwest Africa. This country is listed 100% Muslim, yet we know of over 1,000 Muslims who have come to Christ in recent years. See, God already starts fulfilling the prophecies. Listen, in the past 50, 60 years, more Muslims came to Christ than in the past 1,400 years. I know that for sure. We are getting very close to the end. God already starts fulfilling the prophecy. That's why I, I, me and my wife always are praying, God, where do you want to send us next? What should we do? We don't want to waste an hour. Why? Because if we wasted an hour, we wasted an hour. If we used it in God's will, we are winning more Muslims to Christ. <laughs> he said, uh, this April, two workers of the Spirit of Martyr Ministry, his ministry, was delivering Bibles and Christian literature, I was able to send with them one Arabic glad news book. 
to share with the MBB, Muslim background believers in North Africa, and see if this was a good encouragement to the work in that area. Our MBB, Muslim background believers, contact emailed us, saying this one book, Travel the Nation, two Muslims accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Now they are requesting 500 books. Now, it shows you how thirsty Muslims are. <laughs> Muslims, most of the Muslim people are thirsty people drinking from salty water. They are like Cornelius. They are waiting for somebody like Peter to tell them, oh, this is the way you have peace with God. This is the way, Jesus, you can, all your sins can be forgiven. You can know that you are going to heaven. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they are waiting for answers. Now, the first section in my book, now, why Muslims don't read the Bible with open heart? Because they are taught the Bible is corrupted. So the, God told me, uh, make a study of the Quran, all the Quranic verses about the Bible. So I study it all. I discover that all the verses in the Quran talked about the Bible stated that the Bible is the word of God. <laughs> and many of them said the Muslim must read the Bible. So I put all these verses in the first section with the manuscript evidence, prophecy evidence, eyewitness testimony. I put everything in an attractive, simple way. And the many Muslims, when they read the first section, guess what? Their heart and mind is open to read the word of God. <laughs> so David Witt sent me another email and a picture in my iPhone because many Muslims in Mauritania, when they read my book, they started reading the Bible and they got saved. So he put a picture, they said the Mauritanian government put a picture of the Bible in Arabic and a picture of your book in Arabic and warned the millions of Muslims in Mauritania not to read these two books. <laughs> Don't you love it? How God can use uh, two fishes and a few loaves of bread. You know, talking about God is using the action that we do to do far more exceedingly than we can ever imagine. Of course, we don't sell anything to Muslims. We only take money from Americans. So <laughs> it's about time Americans pay. So we put my book in Arabic in the website, my website, and then Farsi. All the Muslims can read it. Uh, I'm going to read you one more email. Just, oh, this is an, uh, an email from John Schubeck, one of our important pastors at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. He said, uh, he was a missionary in Europe. He sent me email. He said, we give your book to a very dedicated Iraqi Muslim lawyer. He read your book. He came to Christ. By the way, we win fanatic Muslims to Christ. Very dedicated Muslims. Okay, now one more email, which is very interesting. Uh, I mean, all of them interesting, but I mean, it will give you an idea what God is doing. Uh, I try to get the book and the CDs and our materials in the universities because hundreds of thousands of Muslims study here and then they go back, uh, work good jobs. So I got my book in Pennsylvania, some of the universities there, and I got an email from uh, one of the awesome uh, ministries, uh, full-time ministry, in the university, reaching international students. His name is Walter Johnson. I developed a relationship with him. Uh, and he said, my Turkish friend, Mehmet, said that he could consider the Bible and read it after he read Glad News. It showed him that he was allowed to read the Bible from the Quran. As a Muslim, it opened his eyes. He said, I could not put the book down. I don't like reading English that much, but I read 200 pages in one day. This is the answer of prayer, of course. I could have read more, but I looked up every Quranic reference. After a few months, he got baptized and he is now sharing actively with other Muslims while he works on his PhD here in the USA. The man is brilliant, Turkish Muslim. You see what God's doing? All this email. My wife is one of those Muslims that came to Christ. Now, before God has used the Muslim Brotherhood to give the worst impression about Islam, 
four million Muslim Egyptians came to Christ. Now imagine how many more millions is going to come in the next uh, few years, especially through the satellite. One of those Muslims is my wife, born and raised as a Muslim, majoring in Islamic study uh, to become a Muslim teacher, Arabic teacher, one of the most prestigious Islamic universities in Egypt. She became born again. She started talking about Jesus. Before they threw her in prison, one of the PhD Muslim professor investigating her case believed her story because she told them, I, I got no, uh, no, you know, I'm telling you what happened to me. I put my faith in Jesus. <laughs> my life is changed. My sins are forgiven. I want to, you, you should talk to Jesus too. You know, why, why should I make that up? And, and one of the professor, at least one, believed her story, and he started talking to Jesus. He got born again. In prison, she met three ex-Muslims. And, and they wrote their names in one of the newspapers that they could be executed. They started praying, singing Christian songs. They attracted the Muslim prisoners, and they won some Muslim prisoners to Christ. You can get a copy of her DVD. Uh, you don't have to pay. If you don't have any money, that's, that's okay. Just take a copy. You would love her testimony. And you can share it with non-Christians in your home or, uh, or in any event. God is working all over the Muslim world right now. Why? God is love. God loves all people. And God wants to save all people. And, uh, and God uh, is reaching out to people and he wants to use us. That's it. Uh, the greatest commandment that we love God... And we love our neighbors. Now, I wrote another book, if you want me to send you a copy or to send it to the church here, and you can take it. The true love book presents God's love and Jesus in an attractive and simple way. If you want to get a copy, just sign your name, and I will send the copy uh, to Pastor Tim here. And don't forget, Muslims are our neighbors. According to Disneyland, it's a small world after all. <laughs> We have Disneyland in Orange County. God want to save the bad Muslims, not only the good Muslims. If you see a Muslim, tell him, Salam Alaikum. They build a mosque in Oahu. So they are going to grow in Oahu. I was uh, uh, in a few places, I saw Muslims. They are God conscious people. They believe in God. They are frightened from God. One time, uh, I was giving a lecture at Mississippi State University to the engineering department. And I mentioned that, and one of the engineering students, I think, was studying for his PhD. He told me, I am a Muslim. I am not frightened from God. I told him, oh, you don't know the facts. That's why I came to you. He said, what facts? I told him, listen, look, Muhammad was frightened from God. Abu Bakr, the first Muslim leader, was afraid to die. Omar, the second Muslim leader, wished if he never existed because they are frightened from God's judgment. After the lecture, I told him, I will give you a copy of my book as a gift if you read it. He said, I pay for it. I told him, no, you don't pay for it. I'll, I'll give it to you as a gift. It will be my joy. He said, you have the references of what you said? I told him, of course. The most reliable Islamic sources, including Quran and what Muhammad said. This is very well documented. And he said, Please sign the book for me. I want to know the facts. And he took the book. Muslims don't know the facts. They arrived for the gospel. I proved it to you. If, if you are not convinced, read some of these emails. They arrived for the gospel. That's why God told me, I want to equip all the churches. And let me tell you my story quickly. I used to work as a defense lawyer in my father's legal firm in Egypt. It was a good job to make lots of money, but it was not a good job that helped me to fulfill my calling. Very simply, most of my clients were drug dealers, and all of them were guilty. I never met an innocent client. And uh, I found myself every day in court helping drug dealers get out of prison. And you know, you are young, you want to become successful, super rich, and all that, and travel the world. I did it for two years, and then God told me, what are you doing? <laughs> You're making the guilty innocent. You are helping drug dealers. 
You are building your kingdom, not my kingdom. You are pleasing your earthly father, not your heavenly father. You are outside of my will. I can't bless your life. And where is your grandfather, that famous lawyer? He's dead. He lost everything. He worked so hard to accomplish. And now you are losing your relationship with me. Do you want to be a loser now and forever? I told God, no. God said, get out of Egypt. I told God, get out of Egypt. <laughs> my country, my language, my culture, my family, my career. God said, get out of Egypt. I told him, how can I do that? God told me, haven't you read in Hebrew 11 that Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, preferred to leave Egypt, suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. God told me, don't be stupid. It's only a short time you're going to enjoy that success. After that, you're going to lose everything. The Holy Spirit, by God's grace, I got out of Egypt. Came to America, worked in gas station, bus boy, dishwasher, waiter for 17 years. Graduated from big university, UCI, University of California, Irvine. I studied for the California bar exam after I studied English for 15 years. Uh, or 14 years, something like that. And before I passed the bar exam, God brought my wife. And she said, stop. God brought me to you to encourage you. And together we can fulfill our calling because I want Muslims to know Jesus too. I told her, okay. And God, she said, pray. Don't pass the bar exam. God did not call us together to get rich. Leave that to somebody else. God called us to do this. We studied this. We can do this. We are passionate about it. I told her, yeah, I should pray. So I prayed, and God told me, she is right. Your family is wrong. She is right. I told God, but I need to use my mind. I am a trained defense lawyer. I, I have a very good mind. And God said, okay, use it, but for me, not for you. Not for your prestige and build a big house and uh, travel the world. Love me with all your mind. Use your experience, your education, your ability to collect facts, to do a research, to analyze issues, to prove a case. I want you to present Jesus in the most convincing, attractive, acceptable, understandable way to educated Muslims. Work hard in that book. I will give you one case to prove the Christian faith to educated Muslims. Bonnie, can we listen to my pastor testimony before I finish? I used to have an office at uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, with Pastor Chuck Smith, and the many Muslims came, shook his hands, and told him, thank you for the ministry. We were Muslims. We became Christians. Go ahead, Mark. Worker. Well, I can consider somewhat of a friend. Uh, it was a Muslim, uh -huh. and uh, he, he, we talk here and there. I'm not as knowledgeable as I should be about the Bible, and uh, I would love to be more knowledgeable and try to help him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I'm concerned. And, but it's hard to um, answer some of his questions concerning uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I, I would love to know what to do, uh, what kind of format to go through, uh, whether we're giving him a book. I had given him a Bible. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, uh, Pastor Chuck's uh, so missing heaven well, now. You know, hopefully he still has that in his house. Okay, we, we do have a fellow here in our church uh, okay. who is an Egyptian, and uh, he probably knows more about the Muslim faith than what they know. That's me. Uh, he's very, very uh, versed in uh, the Muslim religion, and he's written a book titled, God Loves You, My Muslim Friend. And uh, many Muslims have uh, been converted uh, after reading this book. So I would suggest that if you want to give your uh, friend something that would really help him, because it takes the Muslim beliefs and it sort of takes the Bible and uh, sort of shows comparisons and so forth, and uh, I would highly recommend that you give him this book by Sammy Tanaho on God Loves You, My Muslim Friend. And James, you can Thank call God. the word for today.
where we stopped, if you can. So uh, most of the Christian leaders, uh, I'll tell you one of the reasons, just one of the reasons. Satan used politics and the war between Americans and Muslims. American soldiers killed, and of course, all of us love America because America is the best country in the world, uh, and we're enjoying our lives in America. So we, we pray for our American soldiers, and the most of us are pro-Israel. This has just happened that we are pro-Israel, most of the Christian leaders. So Satan used 9-11 and our love for America and our support to Israel, and he subtly uh, penetrated our hearts and minds and he put negative feelings and thoughts toward the Muslims. Satan is so clever. He will do anything to stop us from sharing Jesus with people and with Muslims, in our case today. Because he knows that we love to share Jesus with somebody that we love or somebody that likes us and uh, respects us and our friend. But our enemies... They can go to hell. That's exactly what he has done. He stopped the, the Christian leaders in America and pastors speak more about politics and attack Obama, attack the American government, and the support war against Muslims more than they are speaking about witnessing effectively to Muslims. <laughs> See? Trick, trick them. Support Israel, support Israel, support Okay, support Israel, but share Jesus with Muslims, <laughs> you know. <laughs> how can they believe without hearing, and how can they hear without you and me? And then God said he gave the church pastors and teachers. Why? Why? To equip the church to do the works of the ministry. <laughs> God did not give us pastors and teachers and the resources and the technology and money so he can increase our knowledge. Uh -uh. The Bible is not giving us to increase our knowledge. The Bible is giving to us and the teachers and the pastors to change our lives and they make us do the works of the ministry. Now, if every four persons living in the world today, one of them is a Muslim, then definitely God want to equip the church to witness effectively to Muslims. Okay, so now action. You can pray for me that God will open for me more doors to go to more churches and equip them to witness effectively to Muslims. Because God wants to, do, to provide divine appointment to the people in the church. But God wanted the church to be ready. Now, action number one. Action number two, you can get that book. I think I have one copy left. And uh, I have one copy in Spanish, too, if you can learn Spanish. Huh? <laughs> but I spoke in so many places, and they took all the books, even though I shipped hundreds of books. But they took all of them. Uh, but you can sign your name and phone number if you want to take the, uh, you want me to send the book. So you can pray that God will use me Consider me your missionary. God will use me to equip another church. If you know any other pastor, you can connect me with another pastor. And then you need to be equipped too, and I can equip you. So that's two. Three, um, if, God, if God is blessing you financially, and above your tithing, you want to help us with the satellite TV ministry, you can make donation, one-time donation to Glad News for Muslims, or you can join, or and you can join my monthly financial partners team. I have people that donate $10 a month, people donate $15 a month, people donate $20 a month. Believe me, without them, I could have done almost nothing in the ministry. So don't think that you have a secular job and God give you good mind to make money that I am more important than you because I am doing the ministry. I could not have done the ministry without people like Charlie saying, here is a check. Use it uh, in the ministry. So the ministry takes people doing the ministry like me, recording satellite programs, recording radio programs, writing books, doing research, 
traveling, speaking, witnessing to Muslims. And it takes prayer partners. Most important thing is the people who pray. Three, it takes people who donate money. <laughs> However, don't feel any pressure. If God told you, I want you to help uh, glad news for Muslims, use satellite TV, then this is an opportunity available to you. But it has to be above your tithing. So your church will not be hurt in any way. Uh, let's pray. Let's end our meeting with prayer that God will use us, use the small uh, resources that he gave us to be uh, an instrument to bring multitudes of Muslims to Christ. Now, between you and me, I pray almost every day that before I get sick, and before I die, I want to take 10 million Muslims with me to heaven. And, and I told the God, that's why I want to focus on the satellite TV. Because I know I cannot get that, you know, I don't want to, previously the focus was on the book, spread it. But now I feel like, wow, my wife's sister lives in Egypt, and she never saw me, and she told my wife, I saw Sammy on TV, I saw, and she's a Muslim. If I can reach 75 million Muslims in Egypt, everyone has a satellite TV dish in the Middle East. I was in Israel. I saw the station in one of the professor's house on TV. Seven satellite dishes that reaches most of the world. And they accepted me by grace. So I don't want to close that door. So I, by the way, your donation will be dedicated to satellite TV. It will not be publication. So pray for us that we can do it and we can win millions of Muslims to Christ before we get out of here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for America, the best country in the world. Thank you, God, for wonderful churches like Calvary Chapel, Windward, awesome people that serve you, God, every week. Thank you, God, that I saw Jesus in the church here. Through the ushers, through the worship, through Lane, or Lane, Charles, and Pastor Tim, and Kathy, and so many people preparing the food and cleaning the church early in the morning. God, thank you, God, because you are here in the church. Thank you for Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, God. I certainly don't deserve it. Thank you for using our lives, God, in spite of our sinful nature. God, today, we ask you to fill our lives with your love and help us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Help us to love people and help people to have a relationship with you and to spend the eternity with you. God, today, we ask you to help us love you more Love you with all our hearts, all our soul, all our mind, God. And to live for you and to sacrifice for you, God. You are worthy of our lives. Today we ask you, God, to help us love our enemies, love Muslims, love Arabs, love Palestinians, and take actions for their salvation, God. God, we believe that you blessed Calvary Chapel Windward, not only because you love us, but because you want to use us as a blessing to multitudes of people, including multitudes of Muslims. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.